you, Tracy. Well, uh, we have finally arrived. It's, it's been quite a trip. We, we began this thing as a seven-week series on the seven churches, and here it is in our 31st week. And uh, we've finally gotten to where we wanted to be, and that is we've gotten to the end. We've gotten to our end, what it's going to be like for us. And I would just like to remind us, think about how this felt to those Christians in those seven churches in the first century that this book was originally written to. Because they were experiencing much of what you see on television now going on uh, in the Middle East. They were experiencing real persecution up to and including losing their lives just because they were believers in Jesus Christ. And uh, it sort of brings it home as we see what's going on over there now and how they just indiscriminately uh, kill people just because they happen to be Christians. And that's a horrible thing. But that's what these people were going to through. So think now what kind of hope and joy it brought to them for John to say, hey, you're going to make it. You're going to persevere. It may be tough. But in the end, this is your destiny. This is what you're looking forward to. And so it is with us. This is what we're looking forward to, and that is eternity with Jesus Christ. So I titled this message, Better Than Perfect. Now you can't get better than perfect. And, and one of my pet peeves, I, I kind of like to fancy myself a wordsmith, and I like words, and I, I like it. And it just drives me nuts when you see some, some guy on television, she's usually an athlete, and he says, well, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to give 110%. Well, it's mathematically impossible. There's no such thing. You can't give more than you have. And the other one that bugs me, and I've complained about this one before, so, uh, you know, that is, and this Bible is a very unique book. Well, that's another impossibility. You, you can't have very unique. It's either unique or it's not. Unique means one of a kind. It means unequaled, unsurpassed. And yet you hear people all the time, many of them with PhDs, use the term very unique. So if I have all this problem with 110% and very unique, how can I then have the audacity to name this message better than perfect? Am I not making the same uh, error that I'm accusing these other folks of? Well, the answer is no. Because, <laughs> because we're talking about heaven. We're talking about God's magnum opus, if you will. And what we call perfect here on earth is going to pale in comparison to what God has prepared for us. You know, when Jesus was talking to his apostles and he was uh, getting them ready for, for his uh, crucifixion and resurrection and departure from this earth, what did he tell them? He said, I am going to prepare a place for you. And that's what he's doing for us. That's what he's done for us. He's prepared a place for us that is better than perfect. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul says it this way, What no eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. And that's us. Now think about that. It's better than anything your heart or mind can even imagine. So when you think about how wonderful it's going to be, how good it's going to be, just know this, it's going to be better than that. That's our destiny. It's guaranteed. You see, even things we consider perfect here on this earth are still tainted because everything is under the curse. You know, again, in Corinthians, Paul tells us that, or in Romans, excuse me, Paul tells us that the whole creation groans under the curse. 
So everything is tainted, no matter how pure it is, no matter how good it is, no matter how perfect we think it is, it's still tainted by the curse. So this morning, I have an impossible task. There's no way that I am going to be able to adequately explain to you what heaven's going to be like. You can just know that going in. I'm going to take my best shot at it, uh, but it's still going to fall short. There's a, a, a professor and a pastor over at Western Seminary. His name's Arzurdia. And uh, when he, he, he's a fantastic scholar and one of the best preachers out there. The guy's just amazing. Now, in this section that we're going to cover this morning, he preached seven messages to cover it. And he preaches about an hour each shot. Uh, and you know what? Even with all the, those messages, with all those words, and like I say, uh, Art's one of the best preachers I've ever heard, and he's a, a, a first-class biblical scholar, he fell short. He didn't adequately explain how glorious it's going to be to stand in God's presence and be amazed by His amazing grace. You know, uh, one of the reasons Jim Kendall loves Western music so much is because <laughs> Western music is oftentimes uh, impregnated with good theology. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, Jim hates Western music. That was a little dig. Uh, so there's a song that's popular now or has been popular very recently. Uh, Brad Paisley does it, and it's called When I Get Where I'm Going. And he's talking about when he gets to heaven. And there's one line, well, there's several good lines in there, but there's one in particular that struck me, and he says, When I get where I'm going and see my Maker's face, I will stand amazed at His amazing grace. And that's what it's going to be like for us. We're going to get there, and we're going to be amazed at how much better it actually is than we had ever imagined. Now, we went through a lot of trouble, a lot of tribulation to get there, didn't we? But Jesus told us that was going to happen. He said, you know, in this world you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. And that's what he's talking about. When he rose from that grave, he overcame the world. He conquered sin and death. And so he has now gone to prepare a place for us. So let's try to look at this the perfect beauty of this place. And, and as I say, this is going to be woefully inadequate. But what, what Tracy read for us there are verses 9 through 14. Uh, you may or may not have noticed it. The number 12 appears six times in that passage. And the number 12 uh, in uh, prophetic language uh, uh, represents uh, perfection. When you see that, and you'll notice that everything is 12 or multiples of 12 when, when he's talking about this here. And so he's talking about a perfect city. Six times in the description of the city alone, this number comes up. This is going to be a perfect city without flaw or blemish. Now, this stands in stark contrast to the other city we've read about here in this book, doesn't it? Remember the other city, Babylon? And Babylon stood for everything that is wrong, everything that is evil, everything that is outside of God's kingdom. And so the new city, the new Jerusalem stands for everything that is good, everything that is pure, everything that is right. And we know what happened to Babylon, don't we? It, it was destroyed. But the new city, the eternal city, is just, like, just that. It will be eternal. We see that it says the city, John saw the city coming down. Now, much is made about the holy city, the new Jerusalem. And, and people try to quantify it and, and do all sorts of things with it. But you know what? The city isn't the point. The city is not the point. The city is merely a dwelling place. Think about it. Your home is made out of 
sticks and plasterboard and whatever, brick, mortar, stone. What makes that home precious to you? I would suggest it's not the sticks, mortar, bricks, stone, whatever. What makes that house precious to you is who lives there. And that's your loved ones. That's your husband, your wife, your children, whoever it is. And so it is with the holy city. What makes the holy city special is not that it's so many cubits long and high and square, and not that it's a cube, and not that it's all multiples of 12. What makes it special is who dwells there. And we see that God dwells there. And who else? His bride. And who is that? That is us, the church, the bride of Christ. And that's what makes this holy city so special, is God is there, and we are there, and we are in his presence, and we can look upon his face. No one's ever been able to do that. And we can bow down before him, and we can worship him, and it says in here that we will reign with him. So we will have things we're doing. It's going to be wonderful. Dennis Johnson, in his commentary on Revelation, says this about John's attempts. He says, John strains the limits of human experience trying to communicate a beauty that lies beyond the capacity of this first earth. And I think he's right on the mark. John uses language, uh, talks about dazzling lights, beautiful gemstones. But they're all going to pale compared to the reality. Which is interesting to me because it's just the opposite of what usually happens in real life. You ever notice how in real life you, you will want something, you'll desire something, and you, you think about it, and maybe it's years and years and years, and then you get it, and oftentimes after you get it, you think, well, this is pretty nice, but it, it really didn't do everything for me I thought it was going to. Well, heaven's going to be just the opposite. We're going to get there and we're going to say, wow, this is so much better than what I ever imagined it could be. So let, let's take a couple of looks here and, and see if we can at least scratch the surface. The first thing we're going to look at is who and what will be there. First and foremost, as I said, God's glory permeates the city. You look there at uh, verses 10 and 11. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. Ha now here's what makes it special. Having the glory of God, its radiance like the most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. Wow. God is there. That's what makes it so wonderful. How do you describe the indescribable? I don't know. We're trying, but we're not getting there. God's bride will be there. The church. And how does Paul describe the church uh, when, it's <clears throat> when it is presented to Christ in heaven? Without spot or wrinkle in Ephesians is the word Paul uses. In other words, the church is going to be perfect. You know, he tells us in Romans that we are predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ. At that moment, we will be. Imagine that. I mean, look around. Some of you guys don't look so good. <laughs> you know, and you may be thinking the same thing about me, and you're right. But when we look around there, we're going to see perfectly Christ-conformed Christians. Again, I can't, I, I can't fathom what that's going to be like. But I know it's going to be great. We're going to see people, we're going to see each other then like Christ sees us now. You know, and when Paul, in the, you know, the great love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, 
You know, he says, now we see in a glass darkly, but then we will see clearly face to face. So when we see each other now, you know, we see some things and, and sometimes we think, well, that person's really beautiful or that person's really handsome or whatever. And that's, that's true, but that's nothing compared to what they're going to look like once that stain of sin and the curse is completely gone. going to be quite a deal. We're going to be pure and holy and blameless. Now, theologically, that's the way Christ sees us right now. Because he covered that with his blood. But then we will see each other like that. Can you imagine what kind of a fellowship or friendship or bonding that's going to, be, going to cause? It's going to be amazing. The church without spot or wrinkled. Perfect people in the presence of a perfect and holy God. Wow! How powerful is that going to be? I mean, you, look in these, you look at what mankind can do now. What humankind can do. You know, and it's, it's just a, our knowledge and our ability to do amazing things is, you know, it's increasing exponentially all the time. Well, if we can do this much under the curse, how much will we be able to accomplish as perfect people reigning with a perfect God? It's going to be pretty amazing. I think it's going to be exciting. When we get there, we're going to experience absolute security. Now, we all like security, but we don't have it here. None of us do. You know, we say, well, I've, I'm pretty secure because I'm 60 years old or whatever I am, and I've always been a saver, and I've invested, and I did well with my investments, and I have tons of money. Well, we've seen what can happen to that, haven't we? You know? So there's no security there. We can say things like, well, you know, I've never been sick a day in my life. And then we get some terrible disease. Uh, there's no security here. But there will be total, absolute security there. Because our security rests on the solid foundation of God's perfect word. That's the foundation with the 12 apostles' names written on it, 12 foundations. Now, in, in verses 15 through 21, John attempts to give us a description of the size and beauty of this place. Now remember, the, the whole book is full of symbolism, it's, it's symbolic, so uh, he's saying things, uh, and he's saying it's like this, it's like that, but it's going to be, the reality of it is going to be even better than that. Um, you look at verse 21, for instance, and, and he says this, And the twelve gates were twelve pearls, each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, transparent as glass. Now you think about that. These gates are huge, and each one is made out of a single pearl. Well, now, I'll grant you, God can make a pearl any size he wants to make it. But, what is the largest pearl ever, ever found? Now, the pearl on this gate, each gate's made out of one pearl and the thing's huge. Well, the largest pearl ever found measures a whopping nine and a half inches in diameter. And it weighed 14 pounds. So, I think what he's saying is, he, he's, he's trying to say they're so beautiful. I don't know what they're going to be. But may, and maybe they will be just a, a huge, miraculous pearl. But it, it's nothing we have here. And when he talks about the streets paved with gold, then he adds that the gold is transparent. Now, have you ever seen transparent gold? No. <laughs> but that's the way it's going to be there or something better. What John is doing is the only thing he can do. 
and the only thing we can do is he's using temporal language to try to explain eternal realities. So let's go on to see who and what will not be there. Because sometimes that's as important as what will be there. And the first thing we see is that there is no temple. Sometimes a big deal is made out of the new temple. Not going to be a new temple. There's no temple there. Why not? Don't need one. What was the point of the temple? It was God's dwelling place, and it was where uh, we, men could go into the outer courts of it, and then some a little more privileged could go in a little closer, and once a year, uh, the high priest could go right on in. We're going to have unrestricted access to God. No temple will be needed. There will be no sun or moon. It's a little hard to grasp, but we won't need them. Because the light of God's glory will take care of their function. You remember, it doesn't say it right here, but you remember in two other places it says there will be no sea. So we don't need the moon up there to take care of the tides because none of that's going to be going on. The gates will never close. And there will be no night. Now think about the importance of that fact right there. The gates will never close to the first century church. To us, it's okay. The gates will never close. But to those folks, if, they, if the gates were left open, they could lose their life. Because the gates were never left open at night. As soon as the sun went down, you closed the gates and you secured shakur, it secured the gates because you didn't want people coming in there and ravishing your community. They'll never be closed because you don't have to ever worry again about anyone threatening your security. There'll be no sin and we will finally and fully, as I said, be conformed to Christ's image. Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? There'll be no hunger, either spiritual or physical. You know, we, we hunger now for, for so many things other than the physical food. Some of us, we hunger for knowledge, we hunger for, for talents, we hunger for uh, spiritual fulfillment. All that will be met. This imagery takes us all the way back to the garden. You remember, God would come and he would walk with Adam and Eve every day in the cool of the evening. Now that's good, isn't it? But guess what? This is going to be better because God's not going to come every evening to walk with us. He's going to be right there with us all the time an eternal presence. Paradise lost then becomes paradise regained only even better than the original. That's amazing. And that brings us down to chapter 22, verse 6. Now, there's a, a division here in what's going on. Uh, 22.5 ends the visionary portion of the book of Revelation. And chapter, the rest of the chapter 22 is what we will call an epilogue. And an epilogue, as I'm sure you guys know, is simply the final chapter at the end of the story that often reveals the fate of the characters in that story. And so here's what he says. The first thing in, in verse 6 is he affirms the truth of what he has been telling us through this book. These words are trustworthy and true. And the Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. So they're trustworthy and they're true. We can hang on to them. But here's a really significant thing to me in this epilogue. 
as we look at the fate of some of the characters that we've met throughout this book. And we find them in verses 14 and 15. And as should not be surprising to us, just as we discovered all throughout the book, there are two groups of people. And in verse 14, uh, we have the first group. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Well, who are they? It's not very good grammar, but they are us, the church. Those who have washed their robes in the blood of Christ. In other words, those of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior are purified by His blood. And therefore, I love the language he uses here, therefore we don't have the, the, the possibility, we have the right. We have the sovereign right to enter God's city. Now you may say, well that sounds a little presumptuous, Pastor. But it's not. Because God himself has given us that right. God, the Holy Spirit, has sealed us given us our passport, so to speak. So if we were to show up at the gates, I mean, I, I don't know that it's going to work this way. And you've all heard the jokes where the guy shows up at the gates and asks St. Peter, what, or St. Peter asks him, why should I let you in my heaven? Well, if that's the way it were to play out, and we showed up and he says, well, why should I let you into my heaven? You just pull out your passport. It's a seal from the Holy Spirit. Actually, it's supposed to be visible up here. And you're in because it's your right to get in. And John put it this way in the epistle. He says this, uh, John chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But to all who did receive him, he's talking about Jesus, to all who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he, Jesus, gave the right to become children of God who were born not of the, not of the blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but of God so you see there all that put their faith in Jesus Christ have the right to enter the holy city because we were given that faith not by blood not by the will of man but by the will of very God himself that's pretty doggone cool you think about it. God, the Father himself, said, I'm going to give Joe, Nancy, whomever, the right to come into my heaven. That's amazing. But there's another group in verse 15. Outside are the dogs and sorcerers and the sexually immoral, and murderers and idolaters and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. <coughs> Don't get hung up on the dogs and murderers and sexual immoral people because they're actually, I believe, the minority of those that will be outside. I think, and this is the heartbreaking part, the vast majority of those that are outside are in this last line here. And everyone who loves and practices falsehood. And what he's saying there is, those that love whatever it is they love more than Jesus Christ. Those who put their faith in whatever it is they put their faith in other than Jesus Christ are going to be excluded from the holy city. Because Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man gets in except through me. So, you know, my, my heart doesn't break for the murderers and the sexual perverts and, and whatever it is that aren't going to be there. But for the good people that have been deceived and don't know him as their Lord and Savior. So there's always two groups. There are God's people and not God's people. But then he does this. There's a final invitation. You see, God's 
not going to leave anybody out that is willing to put their faith in him. So look at verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come, and let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who desires take the water of life without price. Anyone who desires, anyone who asks Jesus Christ for permission to come into his kingdom receives it. But you notice there is a qualifier there. Anyone who desires it. And unless the Holy Spirit touch us and reveal it to us, we don't desire it. We desire all this other stuff. But the invitation stands. So if you remember nothing else from the book of Revelation, remember that it deals with two groups. God's people and not God's people. And right along with Brad Paisley, we're all going to get where we're going someday. So the, what you want to do is make sure you know where you're going. Make sure you're going to be a citizen of that holy city. Because it's going to be a great and marvelous day for those that know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you so much for this uh, great book and for the things you've shown us and revealed to us. And Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, I would pray that your Holy Spirit would just touch their heart right now, Lord. Reveal yourself to them and that they might ask you to let them into your kingdom. And know that the moment they ask, the deed is done. And it's an eternal thing. And it's forever. And they are then a part of this eternal city, the New Jerusalem. And now, Lord, thank you for being our God, for inviting us into your kingdom. We ask that you bless our time now as we take a few minutes to remember the great price you paid, the great love you showed for us before we were even born or thought of. In Jesus' name, amen.